Hey nerds, what's up? Today is my birthday. It is March 26th and it's about 12.15 and I want to start the Daughter of Smoke and Bow vlog because I am buddy reading these for a read-along D-O-S-A-B read-along on Twitter and on so it's at and then the hashtag as well and I'm reading this with Katrina from Little Book Owl, Red from Little Red Reader, and Chloe from Books with Chloe. And the live show is going to be the second weekend of April. And I want to do vlogs of all of these books as well as all of the Throne of Glass read-alongs because that is starting in April. And I'm buddy reading those with a read-along with Brittany from Brittany's Book Find. And the, the Twitter at is T-O-G read-alongs with an S but then the hashtag is TOG read along and these are going to be spoilers so if you haven't read daughter of smoke and bone yet this is your warning there will be spoilers in here so i'm going to go ahead i am i'm annotating for the first for one of the first times i decided to annotate i'm not going to be tabbing it but i am underlining and stuff i am going to be using these to annotate these are the same markers that i've also been using for my bullet journal and they're marker pens from that's the brand name i think tri plus fine liner and i got these from target i like them they aren't leaking through the pages on this or my bullet journal so that's nice Okay, so starting off, six is my first underline. And so this, the blue, the this, it's like this teal color. Starting on page six, this is a quote of, from about Karu after Zuzana arched an eyebrow. And it says that Karu, Karu's own eyebrows did not function independently of each other, which handicapped her expressions of suspicion and disdain. And orange I'm using for any sort of like world building, character descriptions, etc. She describes Issa as well as Twiga, Yasri, and Brimstone, as well as a little bit of Kishmish. So she kind of describes them, she describes them more even later, but she starts with that. And then purple I'm using for my favorite stuff. Um, not necessarily romantic, but just things that I love. So that was a truth that she told with a certain wry smile. That was all it took, that lazy smile, and she could tell the truth without risk of being believed. Moving on, I have some more orange here. Turning her hands into Hamzas, those ancient symbols of warding against the evil eye. For all she knew of their origin, she could have been born with them. She's talking about hand tattoos on her palms that are of an eye. Um, and I know that that's going to be important to the story. And then we have another funny, does he think if he just dangles his boy bits in front of you like a cat toy, he, you'll go scampering after him? And that's Susanna. Another orange, a multi-strand loop of African trade beads in every color that Karu was wearing. At least they looked like African trade beads. They were more than that. She's talking about her scuppy necklace. Another funny, Karu imagined a surge of heat in the atmosphere as if the girls and at least one bo of the boys needed to fan themselves. And she's talking about her ex-boyfriend getting naked favorite who are you kaz had sometimes asked enchanted to which karu would wistfully reply i really don't know because she really didn't and this i love because this is a reread for me of the entire series and i know what importance this means and i didn't catch it before so i really love that that's already so soon like money wishes came in denominations and scuppies were mere pennies um but they couldn't be compounded so pennies you could add up to make dollars, but scuppies were only ever just scuppies. I didn't highlight the rest of that. I got interrupted by a teacher again trying to film what I have annotated so far in this freaking book. So now I'm home. It is the 27th still. I just got home from work and I'm going to do it Okay, so now. the pink is like romance or anything having to do with sex etc. This part is talking about, um, and this Karu thought no longer smiling is for the irretrievable, for her virginity. And so she would felt so grown up when they had sex. There's more details here. It was a shared secret or so she thought. And then orange, or this is red, and I'm using red for like things that make me angry and stuff like that. It might be things that like I think are done wrong in the book, like they're inappropriate like maybe they're racist or something like that i don't think that'll happen in this book but they're also for things that just like people in the book are supposed to be bad and they're doing bad things so kaz was sheepish and smug and crew knew that he told svetla 
The one she later caught him with even made a straight face comment about capes coming in fashion, which is in relationship to how they had sex. And Kaz had colored slightly and looked away, the only indication that he knew he'd done wrong. And in this whole scene, this is the part that I'm not sure how I feel about. It's kind of like slut shaming in regards to how Brimstone reacts when he finds out that she's had sex. And then this is a um, orange part, so more world building. He, which is Brimstone, was always reprimanding her for the injudicious use of wishes. Most recently, the one that had made Svetla's eyebrows thicken overnight. <clears throat> Women have been burned at the stake for less crew, he'd said. Lucky for me, this isn't the Middle Ages. I just put a yay when we s start talking about the Zuzana crush because I've read the 2.5 or 1.5, the novella that goes with them, and I just love them and also that Karu collected languages. She, ta she took the American accent, even though she had claimed to no nationality. Her first language, which was not of human ink, origin. Some more favorites, marionette size. She's talking about Zuzana. She thought Zuzana's tininess was perfect, but the fairy was likely to be rabid and bite. I love Zuzana so much. Issa had stopped her in the festival, and gentle Issa had actually hissed at her, an angel of all abominations, when Karu comes in with the wings that she made for a project the previous year. A shing was the next denomination of wish, and it could do more than a scuppy, but she had never gotten her hands on a wish that could do any real magic. Gavriel was the second most powerful wish, certainly sufficient to grant the power of flight. This is a um, more description of what Brimstone looks like. He had crocodile eyes. This is all related to how, like, Brimstone sells wishes to killers who bring him teeth and like it's kind of some animal violence stuff girls with bloody mouths and it's just ugh. world building they called themselves chimera arms of this is brimstone he had arms and massive torso were the only human parts of him however the skin wasn't human his haunches covered in faded off gold fur rippled with lion muscle wicked and clawed feet that looked like a dragon and then his head roughly that of a ram but they had scales <clears throat> around his flat ovine nose and reptilian eyes and yellowed rammed horn your body is nothing but an envelope Karu. your soul is another manner and it is not as far as i know in immediate danger brimstone also says to her i assumed you felt the same way the way you scribble on it because he doesn't approve of tattoos feathers fell this is the beginning of the plot Feathers fell from the sky, and this woman, she caught one on her palm, and it burned and left the perfect outline of a feather seared into her flesh. Angel, she whispered, wellishing the pain. She was not exactly wrong. That's where I am. I'm on page In 52. Theory, I would love to finish this book by this weekend. However, today is Wednesday. Tonight, I have the rehearsal dinner for my best friend's wedding. Tomorrow, I will be busy doing wedding-related things, and then the wedding is at 6 o'clock, and then the reception, and that's a shot day. Friday, I will probably be hungover, so I'm not going to work, but I will. I do have work that I need to do from home with my online job. And then Saturday and Sunday, I have a few different plans to celebrate my birthday with a few different people. Okay, it is now April 2nd. I went and watched my best friend get married. I did all of the planning that was involved in that stuff that needed to get done. And now we are a month and two days away from my wedding. I am stressed, but I did get some reading done. So last time we talked, I was on page 52. That was the page I was on. And now I'm on page 172. Okay, so the next annotation doesn't come until page 66. And it is, I see you and uh, I'm not coming. And this is in the dark red because it was something that I didn't like. This is Karu talking to Kish. Well, she's thinking, um, trying to prove to Kishmish that she's not going to come whenever she gets called by Brimstone. And it just made me sad. They're talking about butterflies in the stomach. You know that saying. But then they're acting like they're real butterflies, which made me think of Lainey Taylor's other book, Strange to Dream. And I also wrote in purple, which is for favorite, yearning for love made her feel like a cat that was always twining around ankles, meowing. Better to be the cat gazing coolly down from a high wall its expression inscrutable be that cat okay, so then on page 78 in pink i wrote she was a shining beauty life vivid though surely this wasn't what intrigued him this is akiva talking about karu for the first time ah i love it 
And then the light treating her differently than it did others, the air seeming to gather her around her like held breath as if the whole place was a story about her. Who was she? I am obsessed. Sad. So this is Karu talking about herself. She had a creeping sense of impending loneliness. Aloneness. She wanted to be held dear to belong to a place and a family irrevocably. And this is when she's thinking about what Brimstone had said about how she, he thought that she had left him. World building. She's talking about feeling like there's a phantom life. That she was supposed to be doing something else with her hands, with her legs, with her body. Something else. But what? Ah! I'm so excited for when we get to the part that we find out the information. Then this is a little angry part. But that was before he'd been warped by the weight of a terrible choice he'd made. Bent and twisted and driven mad. And this is talking about the man that has Razgut on his back. I wrote, be careful what you wish for. Izil had made a wish for knowledge. But that's how he got Razgut under him. And then there's a description of Razgut above. You know Brimstone doesn't take baby teeth. Once he wanted some, sometimes he does. And oh my god, some sad. One should die proudly when it is no longer p possible to live proudly. That was the man who has Razgut on his back. More world building. There is a way if you would help me. I'll ask her if I want monster. I don't care what you once were. You're a monster now. This is also Izil talking about how he wants to get rid of Razgut and also yelling at Razgut. Um, then again and again he struck, seeming to smite himself, and then he let out a shriek and fell to his knees. This is Izil again. She talks about Abraxas. The only way to purchase one was what with a one's own teeth, all of them self-extracted, which is just disgusting. Ugh, this is the first time that they see each other, Akiva and Karu. This is a description of Akiva's wings. We're on page 96 now. This, I said, the hate to love trope is killer. She kept space around her. He tried to close it and she danced clear. Lysum, fluid. This is when they're sword fighting. I just absolutely love it. Um, more world building. Seraphim were some of high order angels, at least according to Christian mythos. And then this was funny. Brimstone says, humans have gotten glimpses of things over time, just enough to make the rest up. It's all a quilt of fairy tales with a patch here and there of truth. If you can kill it or it can kill you, it's real. Black ink tattooed across his fingers. They were fleetingly familiar. Some hint of soul, and then she saw it. He had hesitated. There was urgent pathos surface, and then an instant of confusion. Ah! Ah, I'm so excited! We get to page 114, and I wrote, I forgot that we see Thiago so early, because we're introduced to Thiago in this scene on page 114, and he becomes very important later in the series. I had no idea that he showed up that early. And then on this I wrote, I wish we didn't get the definition first of what um, Carew's name mean. It means hope. And we say, it says it here, but then I love this line. She ta This is Razga, which is disgusting. She tastes like nectar and salt, nectar and salt and apple apples, pollen and stars and hinges. She tastes like fairy tales, swan maiden at midnight, cream on the tip of the fox's tongue. She tastes like hope. Like mold on books grow myths on history. They're talking about how Razga um, was kicked out, which I don't actually remember how he was. I do remember it being important. It is a condition of monsters that they do not perceive themselves as such. Such a good quote. Do monsters make war or do war, does war make monsters? Also an amazing quote. His memories were nice and he was not pleased to have them turn against him. This is Akiva thinking. We see Madrigal. We see her name for the first time. Oh my god, page 123. The last thing she saw was his face contorted with fury. This is Karu looking at Brimstone before he kicks her out of their house and then they never get to see each other because the doors close. And I think this is the last time she sees him ever, but I'm not sure. They're I'm talking about Karu and Zuzana. Their friendship is my favorite thing. Lainey Taylor wrote some great female friendship in this book. Find out that Kishmish, he dies. He died in her hands. He was on fire. That was depressing. Because hope comes from in you and wishes are just magic. Wishes are fault, false. Hope is true. Hope makes its own magic. I wrote, yay, because we called Mick her boyfriend. That is up to where so, I am. On page I'm freaking loving this book. I read almost all of that part from 70, from page 50, whatever, 
to 172. I read that almost in one night because once I get started on this book, it's like all consuming for me. I just, there, especially this reread because now I know where we're going and like catching all of these little moments that are foreshadowing things and like, uh, it hurts. I can't actually remember if we find out the thing in this book or if we find it out in the sequel. I wanna say we find it out in this book. I'm almost halfway through. I'm just under halfway. And I'm really hoping that I will have finished this by the end of this week. Today is Tuesday. I'm hoping that it happens. It's so good, it's so magical. And then the live show for this is going to be April 13th. Um, so I think that this video is actually going up April 13th as well. So if you're watching this, I think that the live show is at 7 p.m. PST on April 13th on Katrina's channel, which is always linked down below. So you can check okay, that so out. Okay, so we stopped at page 172 last time. Excuse you. What do you think you're doing? Hedwig's going to join us maybe? Um, stopped at 172 the last time <laughs> that I did this. Really? This is what we're doing? Really? What are you doing? You just want to join? 188, I just wrote Hamza magic, or Hamsa, because um, we get this description of how Akiva feels when she shows her marks. So spasms racked his powerful form, threatening to knock her loose, but she hung on, he choked, the magic racked him. It felt sick and wrong, what was it doing? It always held a little something back but uh, not now. Feeling strong, feeling unleashed, she delivered a roaring kata, landing blows to his chest. Just some badassery right there. Wow, he's wonder breading it up. He is freaking cute. Very distracting. Padfoot's right here. Hello. He's so cute. Whoa. What? Cats are weird. Page 193. Another uh, favorite, beauty. Humans are fools for it, as helpless as moths who hurl themselves at fire. Then some romance he blazed with intensity, wide-eyed, searching. Oh my goodness, this new thing that sprang up between them, it was astral, as powerless as starlight tugged toward the sun in the huge strange warp of space. 206, we have long life is a burden when it's spent in misery. Oh, I put a little sad face. Something about his earliest memory. I was taken from my mother at five years old. Then more sad, he couldn't believe he'd spoken of his childhood, dragged that bereft little boy out of the past. He had become him again. Then more romance. The quick bird-like tilt, Akiva's heart sped up. More purple over here. If it were something easy to give, it would be meaningless. He's talking about why pain when it comes to magic. And then Karu says, you really think joy is easier to come by than pain? Which have you had more of? That's a good point, he said. Eretz, that's earth in Hebrew. That's the name of where they come from. Once the Magi believed the worlds were layered like rock sediment or the rings of trees, the seraph sorcerers, and then the chimera slaughtered them all. So some more world building there. Then we have the parallels to colonialism, which is sad but true, talking about how the chimera were basically colonized um, by the seraphim, and then they rose up and got their freedom. We mentioned Madrigal again. He's actually talking about Madrigal. You have been tortured and forced to witness the execution of loved ones. Then you can speak to me about what makes a beast. Beasts, devils, monsters. If you'd never ever known any chimera, you couldn't dismiss them like that. Some more romance. Strange sense of knowing something or almost knowing it. Vibrating between knowing and not knowing. She couldn't register what it was. I'm so excited and then I scream again. She says you have more now when she's looking at the tattoos on his fingers that mm, count how many kills he's made. You have more now. Like, she remembers, even though she doesn't remember yet. Ah! This is, this whole section of the book was so freaking exciting being a reread. I just, because you know, but she doesn't know yet, and he doesn't quite know yet, and ah! Just so exciting. She had seen something in that spliced moment. Ah, it's so exciting. Why then did she know what the scars looked like, felt like? 
She's talking about his shoulder. I'm so excited. Then, as far back as she could remember, a phantom life had mocked her with its impenetrable something else, but now it was the opposite. Here in the circle of Akiva's presence, even as they spoke of war and siege and enduring enmity, she felt herself being drawn into the warm absoluteness and rightness of him, like he was both place and person, and contrary to reason, exactly where she was supposed to be. Because she knows that she's in love with him, even though she doesn't know yet why. This is the thing about this book. There is so much insta-love in this book, but like Lainey Taylor wrote it to make sense why there is this feeling of knowledge, of knowing, of feeling. All, all of it makes sense. And I love it so much. <laughs> Okay, we're now on page 236. So, <laughs> Zuzana shows up and meets Akiva and, like, best situation ever. She's all mad on the phone, but then she sees him for the first time. And she casts a sidelong glance at Karu and said in helpless amazement, Oh, hell, must mate immediately. It was so unexpected that Kar and Karu was already so on edge that laughter burst from her. Fucking hilarious. I love Zuzana. Then in romance worked another change in Akiva's countenance as he watched her with a hopeful, piercing scrutiny. The wishbone was there. He gave a cry that was amazement and what? Something deep and painful wretched out of him like nails splintering wood as they pulled free. This is the moment, the moment that he knows who she is. He leaned into her, looking down at his powerful shoulders as he curled into her letting go of his glamour so his wings sprang visible in front of everyone in front of Zuzana and Mick and in front of like the whole balcony Hazael had an ease to him a lazy smile but at heart he had managed something somehow to retain something childlike that training and years of war had worked hard to stamp out he was a dreamer moving on to page 268 there's another magical description and the moment she cocked her head to one side, a quizzical bird-like gesture that spoke not of savagery, but curiosity. Ah! Then we get some funny stuff. He says, death, I'm ready. And she says, well, I'm not. I heard it's dull being dead. And then he says, dull sounds nice. Maybe I can catch up on my reading. So finally, I start annotating again on page 324. And so we've got some world building stuff. Chimera races did intermarry, though such unions were restricted by aspect. Um, so there was high human and of animal uh, aspect. And so, but it was more than that. Even if she were high human, Chiro would not satisfy Thiago's other criterion. That one was not a matter of caste. It was his own fetish and it was Madrigal's luck to qualify. Unlike Chiro's, her hands were not marked by the Hamsas with all that they signified. She had never awakened on a stone table to the lingering scent of revenant smoke. Her palms were blank. She was still pure. She was never remade, which equals blank palms, which I actually had forgotten about. And so I was confused. How were Akiva and her able to touch the first time that they fell in love? But then I finally got my answer right here. Um, she didn't have Hamsas. It seems right that you were made by love. Um, Akiva says to Karu, or excuse me, Madrigal, and then he says, love is an element, and then she thinks, like air to breathe, earth to stand on. This is Fiago. If she had been headless, he would not have noticed, because he's staring at her boobs. So annoying. Sad, she had known. There had been a I don't know how to say this, piquant satisfaction of being chosen, envied. She was ashamed of it now. She's talking about why she had decided to actually go to the ball, even though she didn't want to be with Thiago. Um, and then another gross thing is Thiago talking about her dress, and he says, one wonders if any, what, if anything, is beneath it, because he's gross. They gave way easily to his claws. He literally rips part of her dress. He's so gross or perhaps not so sturdy. And then shrugging off his hand as she stepped away, but it is time to change partners. I'll have to manage my gown on my own. You go, Madrigal. Akiva herds a group of moths to make a shawl for Madrigal, and it made me think of Strange the Dreamer. 
Eli is the goddess of assassins and secret lovers. Temples to her are few and hidden, like the one in the Requiem Grove in the hills above Laura Mendy. I just love that there would be a goddess of both assassins and secret lovers. When you know what you hope for most and hold it like a light within you, you can make things happen almost ma like magic. I think I have now underlined that quote twice. His screaming was a thing. It clawed its way out of him, gutting him from the inside. This is blue, so sad. Pain to summon, and he tried to work it into magic, but he was too weak. And they did that on purpose. They have Hamsa's pointed at him all the time. Love, peace, wonder, gone. Hope, humanity, gone. Depressing! She was aware of the falling away of flesh. She was, but she was not corporeal. And then this is when she's dying. She wasn't certain that it could be done, this idea she clung to. She would need a body. This whole chapter with Brimstone. Oh, my dear God. I love Brimstone so much. This hurt. Osri made her the food that he always was making her. And he made it so that she could eat it for her last meal. But she couldn't eat. And I'm sad. Hope is the real magic child, Brimstone says. So then some more orange, uh, more world building, archive of the Seraph Magi kept all their texts in one place and they forgot to fear us. That didn't, because they didn't fear us and that made it easy. Half the cards didn't understand our language. We're happy to believe it was just grunts and wars, roars. We screamed in our agony and that's how they were able to l rise up. And then he, Brimstone tells uh, Madrigal that it was Chiro who black, um, who gave her up. And she hid in the grove and saw she had wings to follow her. And she betrayed her for a pat on the head. Brimstone. Fuck, I love Brimstone. She should make her best efforts to never need another body. I have a string of moray eel teeth I never thought I would be tempted to use. Never repent of your own goodness, child. To stay true in the face of evil, evil is a feat of strength. Something was starting to take shape out of magic and will, smoke and bone. I love what they do that. I completely forgot about this. Soft mollusk thing easily pushed aside. Brimstone basically tells Madrigal, because Chiro's soul is so soft and easily pushed aside she can take chiro's body over when she becomes the soul that's in the air after she dies which is just amazing so then chiro's soul was a sullen thing made weak by envy and it was no match for madrigals and subsided almost at once kills chiro essentially by taking over her body and that is the end of the book oh my god i just love this book so much. How did Lainey Taylor write this entire thing? <laughs> like how, how did she make it make sense? This is the only book that I've ever like been compelled to look up what uh, fan art because like the descriptions are so vivid. So there will be fan art, but they're so different that you want to see. Like, even Carew, as a person with blue hair and tattoos, I still want fan art of her. But, like, also Madrigal, and then Brimstone, and even nasty-ass Thiago. But, like, <sighs> this book is so good. I, like, anyway, I can't wait to read the next one, right? here i hope you guys enjoyed this video um this video is going up the same day as our daughter of smoke and bone live show on katrina's channel so if you're watching this before 7 p.m pst on saturday april 13th then make sure to head over to katrina's channel at seven o'clock pst because we will be discussing this book i'm the only one who's ever read it in the past i'm i'm the only one i think i am the only one that has read the whole series so it'll be free of spoilers um for the for, for the second two books so you're good on that and you can read along with us we have a twitter at d-o-s-a-b read along and that's our hashtag for the whole read along for all three books this month we'll be reading the sequel and then our live show for that will be the second week of may and yeah i hope you guys enjoyed this video do you like these book diaries i'm hoping to do them for this 
series as well as the Throne of Glass series because I'm also doing the TOG read along, which is at TOG read alongs with an S at the end on Twitter. And that I'm running with Brittany and that live show will be May 11th for the first book on Brittany's channel. Let me know if there's something that you want me to add to these or like, do you want to see all of my annotations? Was that too much? What do you want? Tell me all the things that you feel and how I can improve this style of video. Let me know if there's any series that you have in mind that you would like to see this of other than Throne of Glass and Daughter Smoke and Bone. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. I make videos every Thursday and Saturday. Please make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. My social media are always all linked down below as well, and I'll see you guys very soon with a new one. Bye!